And there's a lot of mistakes people can make. Um, some of the more common ones we see um, is developers will often underwrite a deal, meaning they'll look at it and say, does this deal work based on what the future is going to be? And that is not something we do at all. We, we look at where are we? You know, another conversation you and I had, we talked about that we look at what's the best case scenario and what's the worst case scenario. And can we live with the worst case scenario? If the answer is no, we don't do the deal. Um, you, you know, we're, we're all really, really good at seeing the best case scenario in business and getting laser focused on that and say, yeah, that's what's going to happen. We're going to, we're all going to retire off of this one job. We're not so good about seeing the downside. And so we really will look at, it's not uncommon um, that when we look at deals, we split the room and have and say, this half of the room, you're in charge of tell, arguing why we should not do the deal. And you're in charge of this half is in charge of why we're going to do the deal. And if you can't articulate a really strong reason to buy the deal and equally articulate a strong reason why we shouldn't buy it, then we've got a problem and we're going to stop right there. If all we see is the upside, there's always a downside to every deal. There's always a downside. And if we don't see the downside, that's where we need to stop and say what's going on. And then it's pretty clear if all we see is downside, no upside. Well, we have the answer really fast there. And so that's one of the mistakes that that I'll see out there is people will buy based on the, the best case scenario and what the future, you know, real estate's appreciating. Therefore, if I buy this, by the time that I get everything developed, ready to go based on the appreciation we've seen the last few years, it's going to be worth this much more money. Well, my experience in 1993, in 2001, in 2008, and right now, that doesn't work very well if you want to stay in business. <laughs> and so I've been pretty fortunate. I've, I'm now seeing my fourth downturn. Um, and I don't know, maybe that makes me a little bit older than I'd like to admit. But but that's one of the mistakes we see is a lot of guys go out because they, they didn't see the possibilities of what could go wrong. And they, they were underwriting it based on what the future might hold. Well, the market doesn't always go up. And we know that because... We've made a lot of money for our, our investors like you on downturns. You know, we did really well from the 2008 uh, collapse and made a lot of money and made some really great purchases and and uh, you know improved the communities as a result. Um, so there's opportunities in both cycles. You just don't assume it's always going up. Another mistake we see is the complexity of real estate. And, and that is that somebody will contract to buy it without really understanding the full picture. We'll lose out on opportunities that somebody will contract to buy real estate because they said, I'll close in 30 days cash. And we'll say, well, I need some time to make sure I understand what asset. And, and it gets frustrating at times. It's like, geez, these guys are crazy. Why would you buy something without knowing? But you know, if you're buying a raw piece of land, some of those examples would be, uh, have you tested the soils? Do you have any compaction issue? Can you actually put a road on this soil? Or are you going to have to dig down 20 feet to get to soil and build it back up? Um, do you have any contamination? We, we did a project once that we did all of the history and all the due diligence. And still, we found some uh, old um, buried gas tanks from the 1920s. And all of our research, we never found that. Now that was a costly fix that we had to do. And I don't know that there's anything we could have done differently in that situation, but, but if you're doing your due diligence, you're gonna discover those things. You're gonna discover, are there wetlands? Are there uh, plant life that's protected? Are there animal life that's protected? And doing all that research, and that takes time. You know, some projects you might do it in a couple months. Sometimes it might take you a year or two to be able to identify all of those challenges or opportunities as it, as it may be on the project. And every project, you're going to find something that's unique to that project. That doesn't mean you can't overcome it. That doesn't mean that there's not an opportunity there. You just need to understand it. Back to the what's the worst case, what's the best case scenario, and, and you deal with it. We've had some of our greatest projects have been projects that are complex. And people are afraid of them because they don't understand the complexity of it. Uh, we have a project right now in a city that, that they had a um, dry cleaner 
was there in the 1960s. Dry cleaners are notorious for contaminating soil. And they they did a very fine job of contaminating all the soil in that area. So we did a lot of extensive testing. How deep is it going into the soil? How wide is it? Is it getting into the aquifer? All of those things, we were able to research that. We were then able to take the soil and through a process, we were able to reclaim some of that soil. And so it was clean and we didn't have that contamination anymore. And a lot of times people are afraid of those things because of the unknown. And we're fortunate. I've got some really amazing people on our team that they understand the complexity of those. They can resolve those. But that's a big challenge. People go in and they don't know that. They get in on the deal, they're contracted, and then somebody says, hey, what about that old dry cleaner? And you know that can bankrupt a company pretty fast. So those are probably the two biggest things that I see are some of the mistakes. But you know, Adam, the list can go on and on about mistakes of developers because it is a complex business. And that's where it's just really important. You've got a team that has a track record that knows how to protect the investment of their stakeholders. You know, that really can ebb and flow based on what's going on uh, in the economics. A great example would be, it would have been about the year 2021, I'm thinking. Lumber prices went up very quickly. So lumber prices have been fairly stable, give or take $300 per thousand board foot. So that's how they'll price lumber. It's per thousand board feet is how they'll price it at, at the wholesale level. So it was hovering around $300. All of a sudden, within a fairly short period of time, we were at $1,600. So that's a massive increase. And that's really hard to predict. And so if you're contracted and you're forecasting $300 per board foot and it's all of a sudden $1,600, you could have a project that might have $50,000 worth of lumber that now all of a sudden that same lumber is going to cost you $150,000, $200,000. And, and that could kill you. And so one of the keys is, is making sure that you're, you're, you've got good contracts with your um, suppliers, with your trade partners that protect you from some of those, those things. Um, you know, we, we saw that, you know, lumber was the most pronounced, but we've seen this off and on for my entire career with oil. You know, all, all of a sudden you've got oil that's 30 to $40 a barrel. And, and the next thing you know, you're at $150 a barrel. Um, and, you know, it's amazing in a construction project what oil goes into. You know, your your plumbing has oil, your electrical has oil, your shingles, uh, sidings, carpets, uh, many of the floorings, oil is part of it. Uh, vinyl windows, they all have oil. And so, you know, if you're predicting and oil's at $60 a barrel and suddenly it's at 140, all of those go up. Um and so managing those commodities and making sure that you're watching the market, what the future is going to hold, and you don't commit too far out. If I commit to something today that I can't deliver on for a year and a half, well, I should probably rethink that because in a year and a half, it's nearly impossible to forecast what all the commodity prices or what labor prices are going to do. You know, we look at COVID as very recent in, in all of our memories. Well, we had COVID and a lot of people were laid off. People got scared, stopped spending money, and we saw commodity prices drop. Well, all of a sudden, the government started giving subsidies. And so we had a lot of government money coming into the economy. And then we had people that said, well, you know, actually, I'm not losing my job. I'm going to buy a new house or I'm going to finish my basement. And that's what drove that lumber from $300 a thousand board feet to $1,600 overnight is because all of a sudden... I decided to build a new house and you decide you're going to finish your basement and all of these projects happen and the economy overheated. Well, the consequence we're now seeing is we've had inflation over the last little bit. And so all the costs of everything are going up to keep up with, with that shift. And so you don't want to get too far out in your commitments because you just don't know. You know, who would have ever dreamed a year before COVID shut the world down, that that would ever have been a possibility because in my lifetime, that's never happened. And so that was a totally unique event. So that's one of the challenges you see. And then managing your projects, you know, making sure that, that people are doing it right. You know, there's a lot of risks. If you build a project and you have mold, you know, mold is a really risky thing. You know, it, it 
can destroy lives if people are in a building you know, smelling mold. So if you're not building according to code and building it the way you should, mold can easily present itself in the house. So it's really critical that you've got project managers that are on those sites and they understand what needs to happen. And they're monitoring that on a regular basis to make sure that you're meeting the standard. But those are some of the biggest mistakes that, that we've seen, um, as well as the, some of the same on the buying of land. You know, some of that holds true too. Is people will build buildings based on speculation of what the market might do. And then all of a sudden, what we're dealing with right now, interest rates are you know, hovering plus or minus 3%. And now we're, you know, we're seeing 8%. Well, if I built a building based on that 3%, trying to resell it, well, my value of my building dropped pretty dramatically because what somebody can buy that for and afford when they're paying 8% is pretty different than it's at 3%. We're very conservative by nature. We never look at what the upside future is going to do. If the upside, if the future gets better, well, that's wonderful. Now all of our investors are, are able to reap the reward of that increased investment. But we don't ever want to plan for that to happen. So we, we play it very conservatively. And we also do analysis. We, we run um, forecasts that we're looking at. And so let's say we're building a, a home subdivision as an example. Well, we're forecasting, well, what do we think we're going to sell for? And we're also doing that, what's the best case and what's the worst case scenario? So if you say, what's the worst case scenario, what would we have to sell this product to get it to move no matter what? Now, we'll talk about this in a minute, Black, Black Swan events can dramatically impact that. But we'll look at it and say, well, okay, if we make no profit, in worst case scenario, we get all of our investors their return back. What do we need to do? What would that look like? And then sometimes you just have to pivot. Um, you know, when the interest rates did this dramatic jump recently, we pivoted. Some of our product, we changed, retooled the product because you know, the, the ultimate uh, amenity in a new home is price. I mean, that's the ultimate amenity. If, if I can't afford anything else, it's, well, who's got the best value for me? Sure, we all really want to have fancy things in our homes and we would all like to have uh, the best of what our dream is. But if you look at a house, a house is a box of compromises, really. You know, I would love to live on 100 acres from a major airport within 20 minutes of downtown with a private water ski lake. Well, that would be just wonderful. Well, which one of those am I going to give up? <laughs> Some of those are going to have to go away. And that's what a house is like. And so, you know, recently we pivoted and we said, okay, how do we make sure we're giving the very best value for the homeowners? Because when you look at sales, you know, it's, it's like a big funnel. We go a funnel and, you know, there's this many people that can afford something that's 300,000 and this many of four and this many of five. And, and that funnel gets smaller and smaller. So the more you can have a product that there's the greatest demand for and hit that funnel as high up as you can, the better off you're going to be. And so when we're underwriting a project that might be a three-year project, one, you're looking at a very conservative of what's the worst case scenario. And two, you constantly are looking of what's going on. You know, are my sales where they should be? Are, is the product what the consumer wants? And you've got to be very, very quickly willing and able to pivot to be able to say, I've got to change the product type. I've got to change my square footage. I got to change my offering. And then the same thing is true on the upside. You're constantly doing that saying, you know, can we get a greater value? Can we offer more options that are going to make us more profitable so we're giving you a better return on your investment? Interest rates is a, a big driving factor. When we bought, you know, back in 2010, 11, 12, 13, we were buying a lot of assets from banks. And so we saw the inner workings of all the mistakes that these developers made, and why the banks had to foreclose on them. And, and it really came down to, in many cases, they were planning too far out ahead they were building too much, too fast. Um, they they thought the market was always going to go up and there would never be any struggles. And you just, you can't do that. that that's, that's what kills so many developers. Is if you've got to play it conservative and if you make a lot more money, that's wonderful. We, we want to give a better return to our investors, but, but what are we going to do to mitigate those risks? And that is, well, we're looking at it. Interest rates could continue to rise. Uh, you, you know, one of the things, 
the, the people talk about is they say, you know, sales have slowed down a little bit right now nationwide in the United States. The sales are not as robust because we saw another big jump in long-term interest rates for home buyers. And this is just recent. But we saw this last year as well. And the rates jumped up and things slowed down. So we look at it and say, okay, there's a lot of economists that are saying they forecast that next spring the interest rates might come down. I don't know. I'm not an economist. That might be true. That might be true. Not true. I have no idea. They might come down. We also know that if rates stay where they are, what's going to happen is next spring, you're going to get people who are going to say, this is the new reality. I still need to buy a house because there's a huge pent up demand for housing in the United States. There's still a massive shortage for housing, whether it's apartments or townhomes or single family homes, there's a massive shortage. So we still need to fill that. But what's happened is things have slowed down because you're going to say, man, the interest rates jumped up again. I'm going to wait till they come down. Well, next spring, one of two things is going to happen. They're going to come down because the economists that are predicting that are right. Or, well, there's one of three things. Or they're going to say, this is our new reality, and we still need to buy a house because we've outgrown what we had. We just had our second kid, or I just got married, or whatever it is, and they're going to buy a house. And so in either of the first two scenarios, people are going to start buying a house again next spring. The third scenario is interest rates go up again. And if interest rates go up again, Housing sales will slow down, but that's going to create a whole new list of opportunities for us. And so that's where you've got to just be looking at what are the possibilities. And those are three distinct real possibilities. Interest rates go down, interest rates stay the same, and they all go up. And that seems pretty stupid. It's like, yeah, of course. You're not teaching us anything we don't know because it's obvious. But how do you look at it and say, well, what do I do that I can pivot to meet any one of those three new demands that are going to come to the market. And that's what the important thing is. That's so critical in our industry. You know, we're a cash intensive business. Um, and, it, and it's interesting, you know, when the market was really good, 2019, 20, 21, the banks were coming to us saying, hey, I'll give you 100% financing. And I'm like, I'm not interested. But when the market slows down, can you call me and let me know who was interested? Because you're going to have some assets we would like to buy from you. Because that's just crazy. You know, if the market slows down a little bit, you're out of business overnight. But yet the banks, it's its like, you know, did the banks learn anything from 2008? And, and some of them, you know, when they sit across me, I go, well, I don't think you were in business in 2008. And so, uh, you know, maybe there's something for that individual to learn. But that, that's what we see a lot of is, is people that over leverage themselves. Uh, you know, if you make a mistake, which mistakes happen, if you make mistakes and you leverage yourself too high, meaning you've got too much debt for the asset value and you made a mistake, there's no room. There's no room to fix that mistake. So we're usually pretty conservative. Um, we do operate off lines of credit from banks, um, but we're very conservative and we use a good chunk of those credit lines as an insurance policy. Meaning if the market slows down, I've got access to capital that we can weather this just fine. Uh, if we have a bunch of assets that we were supposed to close and bring in income and they get delayed for whatever reason, we've got an insurance policy that we can cover ourselves. So we, we keep a pretty substantial line of credit on the sidelines for that very reason to be able to protect ourselves if something goes down. It's pretty tough to grow and develop properties without some bank debt. What you have to be careful is that you're borrowing, you're not borrowing what the bank will give you. You're borrowing significantly less and that you have some dry powder on the sidelines. So if something goes wrong, you can mitigate the challenge. We've done a lot of research on this and we will, we will do more in this space. A year ago, when we experienced, there was a pretty quick rise in interest rates a year ago, and the market slowed down. People stopped buying for a period of time. We had several houses. We had a whole bunch of houses that, that weren't selling. And I looked at them and I said, you know what? Let's just convert them to rentals. You know, these are just as profitable as rentals as if we were to sell them today. And it could be a few months before we sell them. So we converted quite a few properties into rental homes um, and have done quite well. We, we use an outside property management firm that are experts at what they do that manage the properties for us. Um, 
And we were, last year, we were actually moving forward on 150 units that were going to be billed for rent in Minnesota. And there was some legislative issues that we were concerned about that until those get resolved, we decided to tap our brakes. Uh, with that being said, we've been looking at several markets, uh, the Kansas City market, the Gainesville market, Salt Lake City markets, uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, are some of the markets that we're fairly familiar with, but we think there's some real opportunities. Um, and so we see that happening because there is a demand for houses, whether it's somebody's renting it or they own it. Either way, there's a need for housing. And, you know, our intent is we're going to fill it, whether it's a rental or whether it's a for sale. So you just look at each deal and you say, well, how do you how do we underwrite this thing? You know, what's going to give the best value in return for the investors and be best for the community as we build the communities up?